I don't know what they're doing this year. I'm sure there'll be lots of pictures. All right, up next, we've got a review of the D&D-themed board game, Tyrants of the Underdark. All right, Tyrants of the Underdark was released by Gale Force 9 in 2016. Now, I don't remember if the game was premiered at Origins 2016, but I know that year it was a big hit. We were happened to be at Origins 2016. It was one of the first times we'd gone, and they were showing this game off. There was a buzz going around. This is... I was one of the many people that, that was excited about it. Like, I'm like, oh, a new D&D board game, a D&D, this sounds awesome. You get to play Drow, this sounds cool. I got to check this out. Uh, this was a Dungeons & Dragons deck building game set in the Underdark, pitting Drow families against each other. Now, both Deanna and I made time to go check out the game. Well, we didn't actually sign up for any demos. We were hoping to get to check it out that way. We didn't sign up for any, like, official events, right? Uh, we got to the booth. And there we saw the game in a glass case. And I got to say, like, I was less than impressed. This game has one of the dullest dark boards, like so dull that you can barely tell what the art on it is. You can just tell there's art there and it's purpley and blackish and bluish. Um, I, I, I don't even know what the picture was. On it are thick, bright white lines connecting boxes. And the boxes are all, some are white, some are black. And then there's some circles of white. They have more art inside, but again, the art's so dull, you can barely tell what's inside. They look like cityscapes and stuff. Now, all over this map are all these little tiny shields in really odd player colors, like really dark blue, gray that's almost the same color as the dark blue, a dark red, and bright orange and bright white. Like, it was just, I don't know. The overall impression I got is I felt like I was looking for a war game uh, at a war game. Like an older war game. Like I thought I was looking at some new version of Risk that was released in the late 80s, early 90s. Like I immediately didn't care. Like I, eh, this doesn't look like anything I'll like at all. And and boldly stealing directly from the chat room, would you say the board was under dark? That was over dark. That was the problem. <laughs> yeah, good one, Brian. Uh, yeah, no, I have to say, I, you know, just looking at the box, if, if I didn't know anything about it and I wasn't generally interested in drow and or dark elves in the first place uh i have to say yeah no it doesn't really look appearing now no. if you are a drow or dark elf fan then the game does have a little bit more interest i mean it it very does it does feel like those colors are the the D, &D drow i mean it's a very very heavily drow game uh and you know maybe that's forgivable if you're that maybe. super fan the thing is there's so much D art out there. Surely they could have found like a map of the Underdark or something for the board. So uh, the weekend kept going on. We kept, you know, the buzz was still buzzing. And we're like, all right, fine. We're going to do a demo. So Deanna and I went back probably on Sunday or so. Demo tables were all full and we watched people play. And this short glimpse we saw again just made me think I was watching another version of Risk because I saw someone play a card to put a bunch of new units on the table. Then I saw another person play a card and take some enemy units off and say, oh, I assassinated your guy, so I take them off. Like, uh, And then there were these little spy miniatures that, I guess, looked kind of neat, and they were putting out new shields on the board, because I guess, like, the shields are your units. But, like, it just, they were expanding their territory. Like, it literally looked like I was watching people play a, a, a folk on a map area control game, and I couldn't have cared less. Yeah, no, it, it definitely, you know, looking, even just sitting here looking through the Board Game Geek uh, photo listings, yeah, I can absolutely imagine that's what the game is. Uh, I know it's not from reading Twitter, but uh, <laughs> yeah. but looking at the pictures of the game, yeah, no, I, this is area, on a, area control, meeples on a map, you know, that's, that's yep. a board game because it's Drow, because of course, well, obviously, you're going to be fighting each other, but. Yep, but you nailed it there, right? You, you said it. That's not what Twitter's saying. And that's it. Since that time, I have heard so many people tell me I should have given this game a chance. Like, I know people online that consider this the best deck builder ever made. I didn't even get to see any deck builder from this demo I saw. Every time I share a deal on this through tabletop gaming deals on Twitter, someone points out, oh my God, amazing game, you gotta buy it. And thank you, everyone who retweets and comments like that, because it helps some more copies. So fast forward to Origins 2019. I've heard all the feedback. I've heard everyone tell me I shouldn't have skipped over this game. So here I am. I'm there. I am there as Tabletop Bellhop. I'm trying to collect review copies of games to bring home. I am there to work. 
So I went, what the heck? Why don't I go to Gale Force 9 and ask if they'd be willing to give me a copy? Because I still don't trust the game. Based on what I saw, I'm like, I don't know. Do some map. So this way I don't get to spend any money. And I explained this to him. I said, you know, I admit I skipped it in 2016. I didn't think it looked good. I want to give this game a review and give it a fair shot. And I want to tell people what I think. And they agreed. So I brought the game home. And it's been a while since Origins. But I finally got the game to the table this past weekend. Now, in this game, you are playing the head of a drow, dark elf household. Uh, your goal is to accumulate power through control of the Underdark. This is, uh, for people who don't know the Underdark, it's basically a huge series of dungeons and layers and cities that are underneath the Forgotten Realms as you know it, which is not the nowadays default D&D setting, but probably one of the more popular D&D settings, even if it wasn't the default. Now, this is done through a mashup of deck building and folk on a map area majority. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm just sort of sort of poking through on uh, Board Game Geek as we learn because I don't. I'm still learning about this as you as you explain it. So, <laughs> all right. So basically, like every deck builder out there, players start off with the same starting deck. In this case, it's a mix of soldiers that provide power and nobles that provide influence. Now, influence is used to buy new cards. This is like every deck builder out there. Uh, each game in the market is created by taking two half decks and shuffling them together. I thought that was cool because the base game comes with four decks. So you pick two of the four decks and mash them together. I thought that was neat. Uh, the first game we played, we used Demons and Dragons. And the second game, we played Drow and Dragons. Now, influence lets you buy cards. What power does, though, is that whole board aspect. This is all about playing the board elements and the folk on the map game. Power lets you place troops, which are those little shields, eliminate enemy troops through assassination, and remove enemy spies. Now, the map represents a bunch of underdark sites, and they're connected by pathways. On many of the sites, pathways start with neutral troops. These are the white shields you'll see in all the pictures. And the board's pretty stocked with them at the beginning of the game. Now, each of the sites that's on the board, so each of the squares and circles, is worth points at the end of the game for the player who controls it. And that's who has the most units in it. And there's also bonus points for having complete control, which is owning every spot in a site. And some of the sites are one spot, and the biggest site is six spots. So this, I mean, again, not knowing much about this, what I'm hearing here is we've almost got two separate games going on at the same time. You've got a sort of a, a deck building, a, a deck builder and the folk on a map game um are they well are they well connected like is it is it is it integral or is it is it sort of two separate things you're paying attention to so it is totally integrated because everything you're putting in your deck is to influence the stuff on the board or to give you more cards to influence stuff on the board better so uh, with a very slight aspect of also getting points from your cards but i don't think ignore the board in this game at all like uh the, the points you get from uh, i don't know the last two games we actually did get a lot of points from cards i it's definitely two things you have to focus on at once but the two are very much tied together because all of the cards that give you power are just to do stuff on the board and many of the cards you get are going to give you things like um spies which are going to let you put spies out of the board uh this gives you presence whenever you put a spy so this is a good way to be able to move to another side of the board which is very thematic to me with drought because you'll take a spy and you'll play it like on the opposite corner nowhere near your main army and then once you've got the spy there you can start spreading out from where the spy is if they're not removed which i thought that was really thematic um spies are also used to prevent complete control but the only way to even put sp card spies in the game is to get a card that says play a spy like it's not a basic action everyone can do until they can get a card that lets them do it and of course the drow deck is filled with spies whereas the dragon's deck had like maybe one or two. Now, there's also a rule called Devoured. That removes cards from the games. And that, again, was very thematic, because that's what stuff like the dragons and the illithid and the mind flayers did, is they devoured other cards. Now, in some cases, they devoured their own cards. Other times, they devoured cards from the, the market. Yeah. So that was nothing that wouldn't happen. Um, so when it, comes then, to, when it comes to devouring, then, is that the, is that the only way to, pull the, to, to trim down your deck so you don't get bloated? No, not quite, because there's also this thing called promotion. Now, promotion, interestingly enough, this is completely ironic, and I had no idea there was a tie together, is basically the same thing as chambering a maid in Tanto Kore. 
Uh, this is only the second time I've ever seen a deck builder that happens to use this, and I happen to review them and play them back to back, which I thought was funny. Uh, what happens when you promote a card is you take it out of your deck and you place it into something called your inner circle, which is just a spot in your playing area. Cards in your inner circle are no longer used, but every card in the game is worth two, two victory points. So you have every card's worth points in your deck or in your hand, and they're worth more points if they're in your inner circle. So the neat thing there is especially your really powerful card, like the dragons in particular, are huge. They're going to, like, assassinate a troop, move a troop on the board, let you play three guys out. But they're also worth, like, eight points if you promote them. So it's like, how long do I keep the dragon in the deck? Because if I promote it, it's going to be worth a lot of points at the end of the game. Like, there's there's a lot of interactions between the two major mechanics in this game working together. And I got to say, they're tied together really well. That's interesting. It's really interesting because that really does sound a lot like the the thought process of Tanto Kore, where you're yes. you're trying to play that maid as long as possible before chambering them to maximize their usage. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I think I, someone someone that designed this game was had had played Tanto. They must have played Tanto Kore. Like it, it's almost the same mechanic. I, there's no way to make your your. Um, I almost said chambered. Uh, there's no way to make the cards in your inner circle sick or give them bad habits in this case. There's, uh, but there are cards that do interact with the inner circle, we learned. Um, there were people who would devour things from the inner circle. But as far as I could tell, they all affect your own inner circle. I, I still haven't played with all the decks. So I think that's a pretty good overview of the game. So basically, you're, you're using cards to get more influence, to buy more cards, to give you power, to do stuff on the boards. And then there's all the special abilities that the cards do, right? Like, that, that's pretty much it. Now, I got to say, I still don't like the map like, or the overall look of the game. The map is just boring, doesn't really, to me, give me a feel of the Underdark at all. Uh, the map lines are thick and bright that they take over, so you don't even notice the backboard, which is a pretty good thing for functionality from seeing the board from far away, but just so blah. Like, it's a Dungeons & Dragons game. Like, there's artwork going back to 1974 here that could have pulled from. Um, the units are terrible. Like, the, these little shields. Like, why are, the, why are they little shields? And they, they don't stand up well. Like, I actually think I would prefer cubes because these shields fall over all the time. And then they give you the five spies. Now, the spies are awesome. The little drow minis. Why, why couldn't they all be little drow minis? Drows with spears or something instead of spies. I, it's just a weird choice. Throwing the aesthetic away, everything else about Tyrants of the Underdark is fantastic. Like, thankfully, the art on the cards isn't as drab as the artwork on the board. The cards are filled with all kinds of awesome D&D artwork. Uh, every card has flavor text, which is a nice touch. I like that. Uh, speaking of fluff, like flavor text, <sighs> the rule book is fluff and background, explaining what all the different sites on the map are, which is really cool. So you actually can learn about the drow and the underdark and the sites you're fighting over as well. Okay, so uh, reading through some comments, a couple of things, and I, and, and, and I want to kill your fit. Now, when it comes to uh, D&D games, uh, my other experience <laughs> is with um, Lords of Waterdeep. Lords of Waterdeep. And, and in my personal opinion, after my play of that game, I thought, this is a fantastic game. Why do they have to throw all the D&D stuff on it and jack up the price? Uh, it very felt like a pasted on theme. Now, I'm seeing yeah. some comments about this game referring to that, which which strikes me as strange because it, your description, at least, feels like it. It would be tough to do this to consider this a, a pasted on uh, theme. You you could do it with any theme, okay. like I, it could be any theme. But I think some of the mechanics tie really well to the drow. Like I said, especially the spy. Right. The fact that you build out your empire from over here, but you can put a spy in way over there. Um, the promoting too, because drow society is all about saying the people ahead of you and promoting your house and getting people into your inner circle. And that whole inner circle mechanic to me seems very drow. Like I promote this drow soldier. He's now part of my inner circle. He's now worth more to me. And it's also removes him from the battlefield. He's no longer part of it. To me, I found that thematic, the flavor text adds to it, but like, there's no reason you couldn't change it and make it star Wars and your spies instead, well, they could still be spies, right? They could be rebel spies. Yep. You, you don't have to rename it. And your inner circle can be instead your your empire, whatever, in your rebel HQ, right? Like, right. so it's, it's. I, I got to say, like I said, especially the spy thing and the promoting, I find fits Drow really well. So I think they fit, pick the theme that fits the mechanics well. I, I wouldn't say totally paste it on. There's some glue there. <laughs> like there's something well, there. There's I have a to bit say the art would probably be better if it was a Star Trek, a Star or a Star yeah. Wars theme. That's <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, 
a nice map of the galaxy would have looked great there. there I think it would have worked. Now, the other thing comment I'm seeing, and now maybe you can't comment on this because I don't I know you haven't played it too many times yet, but uh some people are talking about some runaway concerns uh based on uh various things like random uh you know, random appearance of combos and also which halves of the deck uh people are starting with. I haven't seen that myself, but I haven't played enough. Okay. So what we have seen so far is no one knows who's gonna win until the very end and we add up the points. We've never gotten to the end like, oh, you won that one. Okay. And then did we've done that and then did the math and she didn't, for example. So okay. it has felt that way part way during the game. Like there was one game where I knew I'd lost. Right. Like the other players were just always had seven and eight in the market. Uh speaking of the market, actually, that's something else I should mention. This is one of the few cards I had, I, deck builders I have, that I really like because the cards seem really well balanced with even the low powered cards being very useful. Like the one cost Cobalt is actually a really solid card. It lets you place a troop or assassinate a white troop, a neutral troop on the board. This is one of the few deck builders where if I have a choice, like if I've done it and I have six influence, I don't just buy the six card. I might actually want to buy two, three cards instead of just buying the six because the two, three cards might be more useful because they'll come up more often in my deck. They'll come up twice as often. And that could become more powerful than the sick. As opposed to Star Realms or Ascension, where basically you just buy whatever the most expensive card out there is, unless you like it's, it's Ascension or Star Realms, like once you really specialize your deck to one color, you might not. But in general, especially at the beginning of the game, it's just, I have six. What costs six? Okay, I buy the six. I don't even have to read the card. I, I like that. Uh, also, promoting is awesome. It, it's even better than it was in Tante Koro. It, it, that was that was the runaway, that was the the killer app aspect of Tanto Kore, and this does it better, in my opinion, because you don't have the whole this card replaces the last card and gets played on top, and you don't have to keep your cards separate. It's just a big pile with more points at the end. Right. And I did like the half decks. I I couldn't tell you on the balance. I'll say one thing: the demon deck is mean. The demon deck adds a new card to the game, which are insane outcasts. And the demons cause your drow to slowly go insane, and they're worth minus points, and you end up seeding them in your opponent's decks. So that was pretty well done. So I talked about the deck building, how much I like that. So now the area majority board game. Um, I thought I would like this the least, and I got to say, looking back to 2016, it ends up I'm, I was wrong. This is not just Risk. Uh, while the board may look a lot like Risk or something like that, it does have some features that set it apart. For one, it's area majority, not area control. Multiple factions can be at the same location at the same time. To me, that's a major difference between area control, where, uh, again, using risk as an example, either you control Africa or you don't. Or, or, well, Africa is big. Either you control Egypt or you don't. I don't care. It shows how often I play risk. I don't even know what the different territories and risk are. You either control a territory or no. It, like, only your troops are in there. And this, you can have all four players can be in the same spot. What matters is who has majority. So that's a different thing. And I like that. Um, and I dig that complete control gives you a bonus. Uh, I found in all the games I played, the very end of the game is people rushing to fill spots. So that's interesting. Uh, another diversion from many standard area majority games is hold the presence thing. So the way that works is you can only place troops in an area where you have troops or next to an area where you have troops. And at the beginning of this game, this means you start from your home base and you start spreading. But that changes as soon as you can put a spy on the board. Because a spy can be placed anywhere on the board. And once you place a spy, you now have presence on that new area. And that is huge. You then have presence not only in that spot, but all the connecting spots. This lets you make inroads to another area of the board that's connected to your home base. And this I found very strategically and tactically important. And again, I think really fits that whole drow. Suddenly a spy shows up in the enemy city and all of a sudden they're infiltrating over there and all of a sudden troops are getting assassinated. It just, to me, that fit the theme. Oh, excellent. I look forward to uh, getting, it, getting it on the table uh, when I get down next time. Yeah, we got to make a list of the deck builders for you to play. Because like I say, right now, this is my favorite board game deck hybrid. There are a few out there. I, I'm putting this above Clank. So there's one board game hybrid. And I would put this way above Trains, which is a, a route building hybrid deck builder board game. I am looking forward to trying the other half deck. I haven't tried the Elemental one out. And that adds in the whole Star Realms thing or the Ascension thing, where if you play a card of the same faction, you get a bonus. So I haven't seen that in this game. And I still want to try a two-player. I haven't done that yet either. Uh, and once you get through all that, there are expansions. There are an expansion. 
there's one expansion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Two more, two more half decks. Yep. Which I've heard are good. And again, add new mechanics to each of them. Excellent. All right, well, you can find this review and more like it over on our blog at tabletopbellhop.com.